Hey everyone, welcome back. So with all that hype about ChatGPT large language model, making API calls, building your own chatbot, with all the hype about these kind of new technologies out there, I thought to use today's video to talk a little bit about AI regulation, which is why I want to talk about this new book in collaboration with Pet Publisher on platform and model design for responsible AI. So in this video, we're going to be diving into a couple of the important topics in AI regulation, specifically to hit on the responsible AI keyword. So first things first, let's quickly talk about the author. It's a great honor here for me to share with all you guys. This is actually the first book that I read with all female authors. I think it's an important thing to know. These two authors come from 25 plus years of experience. The first author's name is Amita Kapoor, and the second author is Sharmista Chatterjee. If you're watching this video, I apologize up front if I'm butchering your name. But I just want to say right off the bat that I'm super thrilled and pumped to see that both authors are female leaders in data science, and specifically, they're hitting on this very interesting topic, which is responsible AI and fair AI. So Amita, she actually has 25 years plus experience, and she has been teaching at University of Oxford, specifically in data science and artificial intelligence. And she has also been an AI educator and consultant for 20 something years. The same goes with the second author, Sharmista. She's an international speaker in data science and AI. She's also a two times Google developer expert in machine learning and Google Cloud. So right off the bat, we're talking about these amazing, badass female authors and that have decades of experience. And I'm just super excited to talk about a couple of the things that I read from this book. As a full disclaimer, this is my review about this title. It certainly doesn't represent any third party, any company, or any other entity. It's my own experience. And I'm speaking from my heart about these paragraphs I've read in this title. So hopefully, it's a fair conversation on fair AI. Unfortunately, I can't really cover all of the chapters, but I will definitely pinpoint a few of the important chapters that I found very helpful when I'm reading this title. So with that being said, let's get started. The first takeaway I want to mention about this book is this figure that listing out all the risk elements in chapter one. Now, I've been in this field for a couple of years. I've actually haven't seen or haven't read any diagrams that put things together in this kind of framework, which I thought it's super interesting. And it's also extremely high level. It's able to break things down and allow me to absorb each different particular building block. So right off the bat, I think risk management can be broken up into this kind of three level framework. First one being planning execution, second one being people and processes, and third one being acceptance. In terms of planning and execution, I think strategy and finance definitely being one of the two important things to talk about. And now on top of that, you have to talk about product and solution. In terms of the second layer, people and processes, me personally, I have been the person who is stakeholder. I've also been the person who's talking to stakeholder. So I actually have been on both sides of the conversation. And I believe based on this pipeline, people and processes is definitely a huge layer of risk. And when I say risk here, I'm not talking about purely good or bad. I'm talking about a changing factor. And that's something that has a lot of uncertainty. And last, you have acceptance. Now, this is actually a very interesting use of words. Me personally, I actually would not call acceptance, but I think it's interesting that the author point out that's a layer of the concept here, which really includes trust, ethics, and compliance. Compliance is easy to understand. Your financial data, obviously, you're handling sensitive information. The credit score of your customers, that's private information. You don't want to just release that out there in the public. So you have compliance. So that part is easy to understand. It's definitely important to talk about. The first two things, it's straightforward, but it kind of takes a little bit of effort to understand that. So we have trust, and then we have ethics. So this first bullet trust here, it's about explainability, transparency, and then it points to black box model. So all that explainability stuff, right? Shapley value, 
permutation score, right? All those things matter, and they can be used to explain a black box model. Now, the second thing is ethics. Ethics is actually very difficult to explain, and it usually is not very black and white. Most of the cases I've seen is in the gray area. Let's say you're in financial sector, and then you're trying to make a deal, right? Let's say you're a buy side analyst, and you're pitching a stock portfolio to your investors. What are you gonna do? Your job has the agenda, and the agenda is to make the portfolio very attractive. What does that mean? That means the future proposition, the potential value added to the portfolio in the future is going to be high. And guess what? You tell your analysts, you're like, hey, play around the discounted cash flow, change the growth rate of your earnings, do whatever it is that you can do to get that net present value up high. And usually it comes down to if you use a higher earnings growth rate to project the cash flow into the future, discounted back with a very attractive investment return, and then that gets you the net present value that's much higher than what's currently traded out there in the market. So you can play around with that formula and then you can kind of change the net present value a little bit and present that same story but with the different numbers in front of your investor. And guess what? This is when bias happens. So the same idea there that's happening in financial sector of course also happened in data science. So in data science, you could very well be involved in a financial planning project that after investigating the data, you think that the potential revenue is flat, there's really no growth there, but your manager probably wants to see a different result. They want to see the trend goes up. And if that is the case, then guess what? You got to go back to retune your model, to play around with the parameters, to somehow figure out the some sort of future expectation, future forecast that goes up to fit for whatever the manager's asking you to do. Then in that case, of course, it comes back down to the stakeholder. So if the stakeholder is following certain agenda, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they usually follow a certain agenda, and that certain agenda has certain direction, certain target that they need to follow because that's what they do. They plan things. This is a part of the planning process in the company then they have certain expectation or certain gut feeling built in that planning. And if your results in data science is not matching that, then chances are there's gonna be a disconnect there and your project might not be able to get into production and a stakeholder might not be able to use your AI results. Now, is that ethical? That is definitely a separate conversation, right? So I actually appreciate that the data and the algorithmic bias points to the second tier, which is lack of human oversight. Now, what I think this thing means here, and it really resonates a lot with me, it's not really a lack of human oversight. We have humans, right? We have humans. The humans oversees every part of the company. I think the oversight really happens when you have a conflict of interest. When you have a conflict of interest, then guess what? You're starting to come up with different standards for yourself such that you can take a little bit more and the slightly larger bite of that pizza, even though sometimes and perhaps you shouldn't. So it really comes down to who's getting paid what money and what is your financial incentive. And all of that is built into who your stakeholders are and what that second layer of risk framework look like and how they interact with this third tier, which is acceptance. So what I found interesting is this book actually used chapter one to set up the tone so that me as an audience get that flavor of what this book is about. So in addition to the layer of risks that the authors talk about in the beginning of the book, it dives into a great detail of what constitutes as responsible AI, fairness in artificial intelligence, and that sort of thing. And then specifically, the author talked a lot about quantitatively how to measure fairness. So in the middle of the book, there's another diagram that really caught my eye and left me a great amount of impression. It's referring to disparate treatment. Now, me personally, before I read this book, I actually didn't know what that word means. I didn't know what it was referring to. But after I read it, it really resonated a lot because it's essentially referring to a bias happening in an unbalanced data set. So this figure is coming from chapter eight. Uh, precisely, it's figure 8.4. It's talking about this Google translation from the language that it detected. In this case, it's Indonesian. And then back to English. 
Now, I don't speak Indonesian, so I couldn't really verify the Indonesian portion of this picture. But let's take a look at the English translation. She's a nurse, he's a doctor, he's a president. She's washing, he's studying. Now, why is this associated with gender? That kind of is confusing to me. And why is gender associated with certain profession? That is also confusing to me. But what I do know is the translation usually come from a training data. Now, I don't really know what that training data look like. I don't have access to it. But what I can hazard a guess is the training data that is about Indonesian language happen to have contexts that indicate that nurses will probably be more likely to be female, whereas doctors, presidents, will probably be more likely to be male. Now, is that a problem of Google Translation? Well, yes or no, depending on how you define it. If we exclude the training data for just a sec and talk about the machine learning algorithm itself, there really isn't any bias there. The bias come from data. If your data is unbalanced, if your data has certain gender associated with certain profession, and that context is indicated in your training data in the text document, then unfortunately the model will learn that. Even though we're not talking about causality, even though we're not talking about this has to be this cause, and this is this reason, and correlation is good for prediction, and that's what the model learned to do. So in other words, when this kind of prediction happens, I will first come back to question the training data to see if the training data need to be taken care of, or are we just feeding random training data depending on however or whenever things happen in the history. Now, a lot of you might not pay attention to this. Well, we're just talking about Google Translator, like, like why should this matter? Well, it does, because 10-year-old Indonesian who is using this kind of platform or using this kind of product that is seeing this kind of context, they might get, they might get a different perception of what that context means. Because innately in a society, it's built in their mindset. And if it's built in their mindset, then guess what? It is very difficult to change that. So this really is an interesting topic and a sensitive topic, I might add. And I think we should be talking about it when you're talking about fairness AI or AI regulation. Specifically, what I want to see is the people who are creating laws for artificial intelligence is working with AI scientists. They're not just affected by social media, but they're really working with AI scientists to see how we can curate the training data such that we can somewhat mitigate these risks. And unfortunately, this is not something that a lawyer will figure out. A lawyer is not going to open up a Python notebook, create that virtual environment, build the packages, and then send the data in, make API calls, and figure out a correlation in between these words, the context, what is causing what. That is not the job of a lawyer. The lawyer needs to work with the AI scientist. The AI scientist can very easily tell you what that association is, if there is any association between certain words in your text data. So while we're talking about this, here's also another message out there for those of you who are doing legal work. Really, really save yourself some trouble. Just talk to a data scientist. When there's a situation like this, don't shut everything down. It's not zero or one, right? It's not binary. It's usually a gray area and we should be talking about it. And I would encourage lawyers to work with data scientists to try to understand what the root of the problem is. In this case, it's going to be the training data, not the model itself. And then before we finish this book review, I just want to say one last thing. And me personally, it's a shame to say that I actually didn't know about this. So apparently, if you have a virtual machine running on the cloud, it actually emits carbon dioxide. This is actually specifically listed out in chapter 12. And they actually have a notebook online to show you if you have a model running, how much carbon dioxide that your model is producing. Now, that actually blows my mind. I did not know that. I thought it's interesting to point this out to my fellow audience that every time you're typing one line Python code online, not necessarily on your local laptop, but if you're using Colab or AWS, you do need to watch out for that carbon dioxide emission. So for those of you who don't know, Colaboratory or Colab is a Python IDE that sits on one of the Google Suite servers that people can use. There are different tier, but the lower tier is of course free. Anybody can sign up using your Gmail and use Python for free. Now, of course, there are computer chips in the back end sitting in a Google factory somewhere that's running, right? Otherwise, how do you get a Python? 
So the Python has to run somewhere, right? And that somewhere is not free. You need a factory. The factory needs to be running. It takes energy. So it really is interesting to translate and specifically to quantify what that energy emission process is, which I really appreciate that the authors list out a couple of important spots in chapter 12. So Google Cloud actually is the leading pioneer in this field, and they actually want to go carbon free by 2030. I don't know how they're going to do it, but I think it's a very noble goal. If we're talking about a giant corporation such as Google that is able to go carbon free in 10 years, I think that's very challenging. And kudos to all of you guys working at Google Cloud if you guys can make this happen. And I personally would love to see that happen because I want to keep using my Colab, right? And I want to make sure me running code on Colab like, doesn't start to burn down trees or doesn't start to create these holes in atmosphere, right? So in this book, in chapter 12, specifically they talk about this portion of coal that can measure how much carbon dioxide that's going to emit. So this is a part of the code that's in this textbook. You can actually download this package called Code Carbon, and specifically there's a function that you can import called Emission Tracker. So once you have that function, you just need to build up some sort of model, and you can test how much carbon dioxide that model is creating. So let's say you have your train model function. You can load up a minus data set. Uh, for those of you who don't know minus data set, it's a picture data, and what that means is these pictures are size 28 by 28. They are black and white pictures, and they're not really high in resolution, right? We're talking about 20 by 28 pixels, so that comes down to 784 pixels. And there are 60,000 pictures in the training data. So it's not a giant data set, but it's a good amount of data, and people are using that on a daily basis because this is kind of like the data science one-on-one -on -one tutorial data set that people use. So a lot of people are running this on the cloud, and here we have a function that builds a very simple neural network model to take that data in and train it. So that's what the model looks like. And once you run it, you can send that model into emission tracker function. So you say with emission tracker as tracker, and then you send the model in, and you essentially produce this outcome. Let's take a look at the outcome. This outcome actually says 0 0.001063, and then it goes on a couple more digits. This is the number of kilograms of carbon dioxide that will be emitted if you run this model. And this is a very particular setup, right? We know the size of this minus data set. We know how many pictures are in there. We know the size of each picture. And then specifically, we also know the model architecture. We know how many layers are there. We know how many neurons in that neural network model there is. So all that is quantifiable. And then on top of that, we know that it trained for 10 epoch. So the model is not running forever, right? We know how long the model is running, 10 epoch. So with all those parameters being set, we now have an estimate. The train model, you did, we did call that function. And then the same time that it's training it, it's running this entire thing, it measures that final emission. So once it's done, it will give you a final emission. Now, this might look like a small number, but this is insane. Imagine there are thousands of people using Colab every day on a daily basis, running data science projects that use data sets that the same size at this minus data. And even that is a relatively conservative assumption. I for sure know for a fact that many more people are online using data sets that are a heck of a lot larger than this data set. So this number is going to blow up real fast, real soon. So I can kind of imagine that if none of us pay attention to this kind of stuff, it all depends on Google to take care of this carbon emission, then it will be much more challenge for Google to handle that single-handedly. But if all of us are being a little bit careful of the code that we run, that perhaps we human race as a whole could have a better grip of the situation before this become a real problem, if it hasn't been already. So with that being said, I hope this video hit upon a couple of the important contexts in the book. And although it's not everything about this book, but I do believe these are a couple of interesting things that I've read about this book that I want to share with all of you. And hopefully, for those of you who are interested in this kind of topic, AI regulation, fairness, AI, this book could serve a great reference for you. And that's it. If you like the video, give a like and hit that subscribe button.
and I'll see you guys in the next episode.